what we have today is actually a industrial power tool. So this is actually from a company called Wacker, a German company, of course. <clears throat> and they make uh, mostly construction equipment. And what we got here is one of their older electronic breaker hammers. So I think this model is probably about maybe 10 to 15 years old in that range. So it's not that old. And uh, definitely looks like it needs some work. It needs to be cleaned at least. And I'm not really sure if this is supposed to move like that. I'm guessing that's some kind of shock mount system. So it should be definitely interesting to see all that's in there. So one of the really cool things about these and in, these industrial tools is there's a lot of documentation on it. So went online and I pulled down a couple of the manuals for this unit. And so we'll take a quick look, see what's in here. So basically got some safety instructions, you know, maintenance. Now here's the basic specs of the tool. So what we have right here is the EHB 10 slash 100. So actually I think it's it must be this one right here. They must have had different versions because I'm looking at the machine number that's on there and it starts with 7023. So it's got to be one of these. It looks like the only change was um, Looks like they increased the voltage so it uses less current. So we basically get <coughs> 10 amps, shaft for drilling tools, hexagonal, 19 by 80, power transmission percussion system from motor via crank mechanism to air cushion percussion system. So you look at that sound pressure, that's really up there. 96 dB, so. <coughs> You definitely want to be using some ear protection. So it looks like we got some assembly, putting in operation. Then we got the maintenance schedule here. So this is the kind of stuff you really don't see in modern power tools because they're not really built to be maintained. They're actually built to fail after so many hours so you buy another one. So what, one of the things I like about this is it actually does have a a real grease nipple to fill it up with grease. Regrease crankshaft every 600 hours. And here's the part numbers for the shanks and the rotary tools. Reforging of tools. Well, I don't think I've ever seen this in a manual. So what they're telling you is that you, you can actually reforge any other tools by following this procedure. So I don't think I've ever seen a company recommend <laughs> reforging their tools. That's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And then we got uh, extension cables. So decal, so it looks like the decal, that decal is actually mostly gone. Um, it will tell you what the sound level was. And it looks like there's actually, they actually tested it. They did an EC conformity test on the sound level of this machine. And it looks like they actually measured it at 104 decibels. So it's even louder what the data sheet says. So what they're saying is that it, it won't actually ever go above 105. Um, so yeah, this thing is definitely, you definitely need some ear protection even if you're around it at that level. Then we got a uh, ISO 9001 certificate. That's pretty much it for the operating manual. And I also downloaded the, the parts manual, parts book for this model. So all of their models have Pretty detailed schematic diagrams for all the parts. So it's not just one exploded diagram, they actually go into much more detail here. 
So, and you could probably still reorder all of these parts. So that's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. We'll have to get everything out and at least clean it. So before we break into this, it is supposed to be working. So we'll go ahead and just give it a quick test here. So I think that 100, 105 decibel level is with the tool in it because I'm not hearing it. It's definitely not that loud. It's loud, but it's it's probably more like 90. So when that when the bits in there is probably where it's making that extra 10, 15 decibels. But yeah, this definitely looks like it's a shock mount. It's some kind of shock mount system because there's very little vibration on the handle. All right, so we know it works. So if we break it, it'll be our fault. So right there's the nameplate for those that are interested. And as you can see, they're based out of Munich. So Vocker is now actually called Vocker Newson. Uh, they were merged with a, another company since this tool was made. But yeah, made in Germany. So if we do a quick little once over on the tool here, you can see that that warning label is pretty much gone. And yeah, the case has been beat up quite a bit. It's an aluminum casting. And then we got a plastic housing down here for probably the fan. And that cover right there is for probably the carbon brushes. And you can see up here there's a grease nipple. So it's definitely made to be serviced. And then this switch, it's very beefy. So you can see there's a little bit of engraving. I think it says rental showcase. Probably was a, a, tool, a rental tool because this probably was very expensive back when it was new. I think the current models, the current Vocker uh, demo hammer models go for well over a thousand dollars. So it's definitely not something you buy if you're only using it once or twice a month. And then we got this right here switches between hammer and rotary mode. It looks like we got a little bit of rust up there. But other than that, it looks like the tool's in pretty good condition. Considering it was a rental, those usually get beat up pretty bad. But I think the first thing we'll do is we'll take out these carbon brushes. See what kind of condition they're in. So it's definitely been gone into. So hopefully you guys can see this, but it looks like there's actually a real screw here holding that down, holding that brush down, which is not something you normally see in most power tools. So yeah, it looks like it's just a sheet metal screw. I'm not really sure that that was what was supposed to be in there, but and we should be able to pull the brush out now. And yeah, boy, you got plenty, plenty of brush left there. And these are really beefy, but I really like the wear pattern on that. Might have to check that out. It doesn't look like it's wearing that little line right there. And there's a little couple of chips on the edge. So yeah, as you can see, there's a, there's a different type of screw head on this side. So I'm not really sure what happened there. Yeah, you can see there's a different a different screw here on this brush and the other brush. So it, it looks like it's a it's what they call a cheese head screw. It's got a very tall head. 
I just felt. And yeah, that's a. See how chattered up that is? It's probably why they replaced the other one, but that's a brass. It's like some kind of brass alloy. So they probably shouldn't have used a, uh, a sheet metal screw on the other side. They probably ru totally ruined the brass inserts that were in there. But that can be fixed if we need to fix it. And we take a look at the brush. That one's wearing a little bit better, but there's still a couple of chips there on the edge. Next thing we'll do is I think we'll take out this housing so we can try to get rid of this power cord. Yeah, I think they over torque over torque that a little bit. Alright, so we should be able to separate these now. Looks like I have a little stowaway in here. Let's see what it is. So I'm not really sure what that is. I thought it was like maybe uh, some kind of centipede or kind of looks like it might have been at one time, but so yeah, it's a beautiful job on the wiring here. They actually have real ferrules on these right here. And they got this protective sleeve to protect against rubbing. Very, very, and you see this little loop right here. They call it service loop. So in case you need to re-terminate these, you don't have to pull, pull more wire through. So these guys definitely knew what they were doing here. Go ahead and pull the switch out. It should just pop right out. Yeah, hey, no surprise, it's a Markart switch. Yeah, I may have to re-terminate that. That's probably okay. You can see here they actually went to the work, extra work of putting the heat shrink on here. Very nice. And then we'll take the mains wiring off. I thought that's supposed to be that's supposed to be blue. That looks more like green to me. I might have to double check the wiring, but there's it was only a two prong pole, so they couldn't have got it wrong. But yeah, it does look like we can take this apart, so we'll probably do that just to clean it out at the inside. All right, so then we'll take out this cable clamp. Yeah, real nice. Got some brass threaded inserts on those, and most of these as well. All right, so now I should be able to separate the lower part here as well. So this stuff. Must, this must have been some foam that was part of the old shock mount system, but it's definitely deteriorated to the point it's just crumbling. So I'm probably going to have to find a way to replace this if, if you can even get this stuff again. Or I'll have to make something. You can see it's all, all in here. We'll try to take this plastic housing off next. And this thing is definitely pretty durable. You can tell it looks like it was dropped a couple of times. Looks like there's another little gasket here. I'm probably going to have to replace because it's 
pretty well deteriorated as well. Alrighty. Whoa, what's going on there? That doesn't look good. Got a couple of surprises here. So that right there is a, a thrust bearing. So that FAG bearing is a thrust bearing, but there's only it's only a couple of uh, roller bearings in there. I wonder if that doesn't look right because it wouldn't be centered. So it looks like that bearing exploded or something like that. And what they did is they just cleaned it out. Yeah, you can see some... It's almost like shrapnel. But yeah, we got some pretty nice brush holders here. Yeah, actually, the looks like the, the spring is actually... It's, it is magnetic, but it's, um, it's, not, it's not steel magnetic because it's a very strong magnet. So it probably is some kind of um, stainless steel, maybe, alloy. Hard to say. So that would probably would explain the, uh, the wear pattern that we were seeing on the brushes. If um, all these roller bearings weren't in here, it was probably wobbling. So let's see if we can at least, yeah. There's a part of what's left of that bearing. But frankly, I'm surprised this thing even ran with all this happening. So we'll go ahead and um, take out these brush holders, get that out of the way. All right, so we're not gonna be able to pull this out. There's actually a retaining ring, it looks like in there. So I think next we'll take off this plate and have a look inside there. All right, so it actually looks like we got a we gotta go the opposite direction. We gotta take a go from this end first. Well, it's turning. This part should come off. Yep, it's coming. So that looks to be all just one assembly there. That one was really stuck. <clears throat> Yeah, there's definitely some long bolts there. Just pop this out. It's just a cover. We got a nice beefy gear in there. That should actually come out. Yep. We got a pin. And it looks like there's a plate. Lots of grease on it. And then there's the actual hammer. 
So this whole thing should yeah just slide right out. It came out pretty easy. So the next thing we're going to do, we're going to try taking out this roll pin, which is a four millimeter by 28 millimeter. So let's see how easy this comes out. Oh, that thing was really in there. Man. All right. And this should slide right out. It looks like there was an o-ring on there. Long gone. So I'll probably have to replace that. Yeah, there's a little pin in there as well. Spring. That's basically just the spring for the lever. Right, back onto the main assembly here. So let's see. All right. Yeah, that was just really stuck on there on that piston. That was a problem. Looks like we got like a circlip type clip in there. There it goes. And there's our hammer assembly. Okay, so now we can take a look at what's going on in here. Let's see if that will finally allow us to open up this cover now. It's not really the best design put that bearing up there in that housing. Probably would have preferred there to be some kind of secondary housing because you're putting a lot of stress on I mean, there's really nowhere to attach to it to pull even with a bearing puller. So you, you're putting a lot of stress on this arm and trying to pull that out. So this is what we're going to have to do I guess. All right, well, I got it out, not in the way that I thought it was supposed to come out, but I think what I ended up doing was popping this bearing right here. I believe there's a, a needle thrust bearing that goes on this machine surface, but I was expecting to pop this shaft off in here, right under there. And I don't know why it didn't come out, because it really should have come out. So I finally was able to get the field lines out. I ended up having to use a puller, a gear puller to do it. So this is my Belzer, my Belzer Davi Dot puller, which I had the original box for. But yeah, that thing was really in there. So I had to use a puller to get this out of the housing, and I had to use a puller again to get this out of this housing because of all the corrosion, the rust. So yeah, we're getting a little bit of delamination there, but I think it should be okay. So if you look in there, there's another bearing that was destroyed, and that was the 
bearing on the other end of the shaft. So we gotta pull out what's left in there. So it looks like a 6004 bearing and then we'll have to replace that one. All right, so I managed to get that other bearing out. It was a really tight fit in there. You can see down in there, 6004.C3. It's an FAG bearing. I had some trouble trying to get this last piece out, so I ended up having to go to work to use some of their hydraulic press and bearing pulling tools. But what I did find out is it doesn't say it anywhere in the manual, but this piece is actually threaded. And so I think the way to actually take this off, but it doesn't thread all the way through, which is interesting. I thought maybe if you keep putting a screw in it would push this out, but that's not the case. So coincidentally this piece right here actually is that fits that thread. It's an M12 coarse thread. And um, what I end up doing is, is pulling it once I got that in there good enough. And first thing it pulled out was actually the whole entire bearing housing. Um, I was thinking it was going to pull this out. So once I pulled that out I had, I had to pull this off with just a normal bearing extractor by keeping the screw in there and then just pushing down on the screw while it's inserted. And then once you get that out, there's a circlip in there, and then there's a double. These two bearings are stacked right on top of each other, like that. And I don't know if I've ever seen this type of bearing before. It's a, it's a 16004. It's kind of interesting how they stacked them up. So the, there are two broken bearings in there. This FAG one, this is RNA-NA. 1902 and then there's uh, another FAG 6004.C4 now this the C4 bearing is actually quite it's not very common you can find the 6004 pretty easily but they're usually the C3 which is a a looser tolerance so I think they had a reason to pick the C4 so we might as well try to find one I don't know if I'll be able to find another FAG with that that same characteristic but we'll look see what we can find. We might just have to end up ordering a, a Japanese bearing uh, to put in there. So I had a little issue. As you can see there's a hole now in this casing. So what happened is, look at this picture, this diagram, and it looks like the only thing that's holding it in is friction. According to this diagram, the only thing holding that bearing in is friction. The only thing holding that shaft in is friction against the bearing. So what I end up doing was sticking a puller all the way through that shaft because that's hollow all the way through, and then putting the sides on on this piece right here, and then pulling that way. Because according to this diagram, it should come out. But what happens is that it actually broke through the casting. And that's pretty thin stuff there. It's not exactly thick. Thick material. And what I end up finding is there's actually two circlips on there. There's one on the shaft right here. And there's also one inside of this housing to hold that bearing in. So it's a total fail of the uh, documentation here to tell you that because there was so much grease caked in there there's no way to tell that there was a circlip in there. So once I got the circlips off I was able to pull it out pretty easily. But really there's no reason to make that a hollow shaft right there. If they would have just made that solid, there's no way that anybody could have done that. So, probably just going to try to patch this up. Really hate to run right through the logo. What we'll probably just do is cut a little piece of aluminum. I'll either braze it or just probably s screw it on. Maybe put some tapped holes in there. Uh, because nothing's really putting pressure on that. Uh, nothing really should be touching that at all. 
uh, but it is kind of in the grease compartment so we need to seal it up but it's kind of annoying and I did look up the price of this part it's $110 uh, if you get it from an official distributor I might be able to find one on eBay if somebody's parting one of these out but yeah stuff like that happens but luckily it didn't break anything real critical alright we'll get cleaned up here and we'll continue forward <laughs> 